the word sati in Pali has lots of meanings. The basic one is keeping something in mind. We're often told that it means alertness or awareness, but that's not the case. Alertness and awareness, that come, those come under the words sampachanya in Pali. Sati means keeping something in mind, like remembering to stay with the breath, remembering the various things that help in the training of the mind. It functions in a lot of ways in the practice. First off, there are the recollections, a series of themes to think about when you find your meditation wandering off course, either in the direction of doubt or in the direction of laziness or in the direction of discouragement, or just general hopelessness. There are things to remember, things to keep in mind. Like that chant we had just now about aging, illness, and death, that's, those are important things to keep in mind. so you don't get complacent. But notice the Buddha didn't stop with aging, illness, and death. He went on to the principle of karma. Because if you, all you think about is aging, illness, and death, it gets pretty discouraging. But there is a potential for happiness, he says, and it lies in our actions. In other words, he didn't teach fatalism. He didn't teach, teach us that our actions are insignificant. They are important, our happiness or our, our lack of happiness in our lives depends on our actions. So that's where we focus our attention. We should keep that in mind. This is called tamanusati, keeping the dharma in mind. And this is why the Buddha has us listen to the dharma, read the dharma, because there are useful directives in there for the practice. Sometimes it seems especially that the more theoretical passages get in the way, but there, there are lots of encouraging passages as well. That's the passage where the Buddha is talking to his son, and he says, you know, when you make a mistake, resolve not to make it again. If you see that your actions have been off course, okay, resolve not to do it again. When they have been on course, he says, develop a, a sense of joy, a sense of happiness. Many times we mistrust that. We think somehow that the critical thoughts in our mind are more real and the more self-congratulatory thoughts are diluted. Well, that's not the case. When you do something right, you should congratulate yourself on it as a means of encouragement to give some life to the path. Otherwise, it's very easy for things to get dry. You criticize yourself about this, criticize yourself about that, and you find yourself totally hemmed in. Remember that you do do some things right, and focus on those to put the mind in a good mood. In Thai, they use the word arom to mean both mood and object. When we're meditating, we're looking for both a good mood and a good object. So that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. That's another function of sati, mindfulness. In particular, two of the recollections, sila nusati, chaka nusati. Thinking about the times that we did hold to our principles, thinking about the times we have been generous. Call those to mind as a way of giving yourself energy on the path. doesn't mean that you have to reflect on perfect virtue or perfect generosity. Reflect on what you've got as a means of encouragement. So there are topics of recollection for just about every direction the mind can fall off. Topics of recollection to bring it back onto the path. Once you're on the path, it's important to reflect again on what sati or mindfulness means. You're keeping something in mind. Say, for instance, you're keeping in mind of the breath. It's like you're tuning into that part of your experience. Our experience has many la layers. You might think of it as many frequencies, like the radio waves going through, this, through the air right now. There are lots of different frequencies coming right through this building. 
from Los Angeles, San Diego. And if you bring a radio in here, you can tune in to lots of different stations. It's simply a matter of choosing which frequency to tune into, which layer to tune into. And it's the same thing when you're keeping mind of the breath. When you create a frame of reference here in the present moment, there are lots of things you could use as a frame of reference. You can choose the body, you can choose feelings, mental states, mental qualities. Those are the frequencies that are on the path. There are other frequencies that are off the path, but there are lots of different levels of sensation and awareness, lots of different realities that you could tune into right now. So again, it's a matter of choosing the ones that are most beneficial for the mind. So you focus in on the breath. Try to be aware of the breath in relationship to everything you do. While you're sitting here quietly with your eyes closed, and when you get up and walk away, try to stay with the breath. When you do work, stay with the breath. When you rest, stay with the breath. If you're going to change your frame of reference, try to be deliberate about it. When you look in the sutta, the Buddha talks about being aware of the body in and of itself. It could either be internally or externally. Externally means how the body relates to the world outside. In other words, you don't have to be only inside the body for, for it to count as mindfulness, to count as, for it to count as right mindfulness. When you're dealing with other people, you have to have a frame of reference that includes the outside world. And then when you're sitting again with your eyes closed, you can make it totally internal if you like. Or you can tune into the sense of space which permeates the body and extends out in all directions. So a lot of different things to tune into that would qualify as the body in and of itself. It's important to realize this, because sometimes we get into an ironclad notion that only certain kinds of awareness count as mindfulness. And then we feel that we're strapped there. And you find that you can't function. They talk about people who go for long retreats. Or they've been working on only one kind of mindfulness for three months, and they come out and they can't function. It takes them a couple days to readjust to being in the outside world. Well, the Buddha didn't have us practice so that we couldn't adjust or couldn't adapt. The point is being conscious and deliberate about the different adaptions, the different levels that you're tuning into, the layers you're tuning into, the different frequencies you're tuning into. There's a science fiction story read years back about a spaceship. And the spaceship didn't have to use fuel. It moved by changing its frame of reference. If its frame of reference was here on Earth, it would stay still on Earth. If it switched its frame of reference to the sun, it would suddenly move out in the other direction, away from the direction that the Earth is, is revolving around the Sun. If it switched its frame of reference to the center of the galaxy, it was way out. And the plot of the story revolved around the fact that when the ship changed its frame of reference, everybody in the ship would go unconscious for a while. Well, this is exactly how our minds work. Normally we change our frame of reference who knows how many times in the course of the day, and we kind of blank out in between. John Lee even uses the word that we pass out for, us for just a brief moment, then we're in another frame of reference. And the purpose of the practice we're doing now is so that we can change our frames of references without blanking out, so we're clear about what we're doing. This way we can function appropriately. When you're dealing with people, okay, you've got the proper frame of reference that includes them and includes that level of reality, that level of experience. When you're sitting here with your eyes closed, you can drop that frame of reference. You don't have to think about there being anyone else here in the room at all. And you see how much this, your frames of reference really do depend on memory. What are you going to remember in order to deal with the reality before you? And you can be selective. Years back, when I was a young monk in Thailand, the monastery where I was staying, at a 
rota- uh, roster of monks rotating who give different Dharma talks. And out of the 14 monks who were giving Dharma talks, maybe two could give good ones. And the rest were really irritating. And after a while I realized that rather than getting, give in to my irritation, I could use it as a meditation exercise, how to be aware of the sound of the Dharma talk without registering the meaning. In other words, deliberately forgetting the meaning and remembering only to be with the level of the sound. That's a function of sati, mindfulness, deciding what you're going to remember, what you're not going to remember, what you're going to apply to your experience and what you're not. And I found that after a while I could just listen to the sound, word by word by word, and consciously forget the last word and be only with the sound of the current word. It worked a little bit easier because it wasn't my native language. You might want to try this skill out yourself. If you don't like the Dharma talks that you hear around here, well, you can just be with the sound and don't have to listen to the meaning. Be selectively forgetful. Now, that requires an act of mindfulness in order to be forgetful in that way. In other words, deciding which level you're going to tune into and let everything else go for the time being. If you're going to work on concentration, you'll want to stay on one level as consistently as possible. This is why concentration practice is best done alone or in areas where you don't have to interact with people. But you can also balance it, and it's important that you do learn to balance it with interactions with other people in a peaceful way. So you can consciously change your frame of reference as appropriate. This is an important skill because it's in the changing of the frame of reference that a lot of the machinations of the mind become clear. We tend not to see them. We're in that little moment of blanking out. But if you can learn to be conscious as we switch from one frame to the next, you begin to see the way the mind acts, the way it creates a reality for itself out of all the whole buzz and confusion, to use someone's term, of all the sensory input that comes in any one particular moment. You make a choice what you're going to pay attention to, what you're going, what memories, what levels of reality you're going to bring to that particular moment. And it's important, and it's an important mental skill to be able to shift your frame of reference as necessary. So remember, it's all part of the practice. It's not only when we're on the level of pure sensation that we're really being mindful. We're mindful as we shift our frame of reference to be appropriate to whatever is needed. If you go into the kitchen and you're totally on the frame, on the level of pure sensation, you're going to forget how to fix the food. You have to remember enough to fix the food. When you're dealing with other people, you have to remember enough, you know about common courtesy, remember enough about the English language in order to deal with them. But you can be selectively forgetful when you want to, when you're sitting here with your eyes closed. Then you find you can take that skill and apply it to all sorts of situations. So remember that mindfulness is not just one level of awareness, one level of experience. It's being very deliberate and clear about what you're doing, what you're going to remember, what you're not going to remember, what you're going to recollect, what you're going to let go, which things to recollect are useful right now. If you wanted to, you could sit here and spend the whole hour thinking about things that would make you totally miserable, but what does that accomplish? We're hitting, sitting here to think about things that aren't useful for the mind. So remember the things that are useful for the mind, that are helpful for the mind, that will help it develop. And as for the other voices that come in and out of the mind, but listen to the ones that are helpful and ignore the ones that are not. You can be selective in this way. This way mindfulness becomes a quality that we can apply to everything that we do. And instead of making us unable to function, it actually heightens our ability to function. Because we understand the process that the mind goes through as it shifts its frame of reference from 
pure sensation to remembering language, remembering customs, whatever needs to be applied to your current experience, to your current task. So try to keep these points in mind when they're useful.